Hi everyone, oh, welcome back to the Defender Track. I'm Mohamed Farhan, a volunteer in the OASP community and I'll be moderating this session. Uh, during the next 45 minutes, you'll be listening to Suhail present everything you wanted to know about client-side CSRF but were afraid to ask. Uh, please submit any questions you have during the session in the Q&A tab right next to this video on the HUA platform. I'll be asking Suhail your questions in the last 10 minutes of the session. Uh, please note that the chat function in Zoom is disabled for attendees, but you can leave all the comments in the chat tab in Hua. Uh, just a quick introduction about Suhail. Suhail is a PhD candidate in CASPA Helmholtz Center of Inno Information Security, Germany, researching in the area of web security, automated vulnerability detection, static and dynamic analysis techniques. Suhail holds a double master's degree in computer science. He has published his works in top tier conferences like NDSS, IEEE SNB, and has been invited to present his recent works at the Stanford Security Lunch. Among his contributions, he proposed the first taxonomy and detection of cross-site leaks, one of the first studies about the client-side CSRF, CSRF defenses, including the same-site adoption and other client-side vulnerabilities. Finally, Suhail is a developer and a maintain, maintainer of the JavaScript analysis framework, otherwise called Joe, one of his first open source client side JavaScript analysis frameworks. Welcome, Suhail, to our AppSec EU. Over to you. Um, thanks, Farhan, for the great introduction. So, hello, everybody, and welcome to this talk. My name is Suhail, and today I'll be presenting everything you wanted to know about clients of CSER, but they're afraid to ask. So if you're interested already about this talk and clients as CSRF attacks, don't forget to scan this QR code down here where you will find our technical paper, open source tool, and other useful information. So um, before we get started, let me say a couple of words about me. So Farhan already um, uh, did introduce me, but I just want um, to reiterate um, that I'm a web security researcher from CISPA Germany, I'm currently doing my PhD from 2019. And my area of expertise and research uh, focuses on building uh, reusable testing tools and techniques for web vulnerability detection, ranging from cross origin attacks to side channel information leakage, leveraging both static and dynamic analysis techniques. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. We know that finding vulnerabilities in, in web applications is, is important. There are over 4.8 billion websites online for banking, shopping, education and so on, with around 1.8 billion users online. And these applications contain a variety of security sensitive data. And what we also know is that the number of vulnerabilities in, in web applications have been increasing uh, in, in recent years. However, what has been somehow ignored is that the complexity of web applications are also rising. Web applications today are far more complex than they used to be before. Okay, so sorry for the delay. Um, I had a problem with um, the slides uh, moving automatically. So, okay, so uh, what I was saying was that we know that finding vulnerabilities in web applications is important. And we also know that the number of vulnerabilities in web applications have been increasing in, in recent years. However, uh, what has been somehow ignored is that the complexity of web applications are also rising. Um, what has been ignored is that, you know, Web applications are far more complex uh, today than they were before. And as a result of these um, um, existing detection tools fall short of addressing this uh, you know, ever increasing complexity. As a result, there's a gap between what we can detect and the complexity of web applications. And in my research, I try to narrow down this gap. To better understand this problem, let's take a look at an example of a very old but critical uh, vulnerability. Uh, that is uh, cross-site request forgery or shortly uh, CSERF, a, a confused deputy security problem. So let us first refresh our knowledge about CSERF attacks. Uh, what is a CSERF? Basically, in this attack, there are three main actors involved. Um, a victim, an attacker controlling a malicious web page, and a target website, say uh, bank.com. Um, as you can see, attack.com, where the attacker is located, uh, is a different site or web origin than bank.com. And that's why the term cross-site uh, exists in the attack title. So decomposing a CSERF into uh, steps, the attack is comprised of two phases, the preparation and the attack phase. First, during the preparation phase, the attacker prepares a malicious web page that includes a cross-origin um, or cross-site resource from the target site. 
um, that if requested by the authenticated uh, user results in a security sensitive uh, operation like a bank transfer. So here, for instance, that tag page includes a script tag whose um, SLC attribute is set to bank.com slash transfer amount uh, 1000 and to attacker. So basically this results in an illicit money transfer uh, to the attacker's account um, if the victim visits this attack page. Now during the attack page, the attacker convinces the victim to visit this malicious web page. And this resource inclusion uh, tricks the victim's browser to send an unintentional uh, forge request toward the target site uh, automatically including the session cookies of the victim in this request, simply because the browser complies with the same origin policy for uh, cookies. Consequently, this request uh, results in a security sensitive state changing operation like a bank transfer to be executed, but without the victim consent, awareness or intention. Now, this is an example of a, a CSERF attack, which is a confused deputy security flaw, but do we know how to solve them? Um, because CSERF attacks are an old uh, security problem. And of course, the answer is yes, robust anti-CSERF defenses are, are well known and there are indeed a plethora of these uh, defenses. However, generally speaking, we can group these defenses and defense in depth methods in four distinct categories, each addressing a different aspect of uh, CSERF attacks. The first group of defenses are origin checks that examine if the origin of an incoming HTTP request belong to a trusted uh, domain or not. So examples of these defenses are, for instance, refer origin header checks or custom HTTP headers like uh, X request bit uh, that are added to the requests. So in this particular example, the origin of the request is attack.com, which is not a trusted domain for bank.com. And therefore bank.com can simply reject the request instead of serving it. The second group of defenses add unguessable pseudo-random parameters to the request so that the attacker cannot reliably reproduce or replay the request, such as uh, synchronizer CSEF tokens, double submit cookies, uh, triple submit cookies, uh, HMAC tokens, and so on. Consequently, the attacker cannot reconstruct the valid request and the target site can just reject it. The third category of defenses address the problem that arises by uh, browsers complying to the same merging policy for cookies, which is essentially the automatic inclusion of HTTP cookies in a cross-site request context, also known as the ambientatory problem. And the way they do so is by limiting the scope of cookies to a first party context. For example, by leveraging the browser built-in uh, solutions like the recently uh, proposed same-site cookies policies, um, or third-party solutions like custom browser extension and HTTP uh, proxies, uh, the most famous of which are Request Rodeo, Beep, CS Fire, and so on. And finally, the last category of these CSERF defenses aim to verify uh, the user intention. For example, through enforcing re-authentication, one-time tokens, uh, captures, and re recaptures. So having these defenses properly enforced, it seems that CSF attacks can be old news. Great, right? Well, as it turned out, that's not the case. And let me show you an example why. Assume that we have this L application, again, say bank.com, which has this piece of client-side JavaScript code. The code first reads the URL uh, hash fragment and then um, without sanitization, use it as a pass of an API endpoint to which an asynchronous request is sent. Note that this request contains a valid um, anti-forgery token. If you have such vulnerable web application and uh, attacker uh, can craft a malicious URL and lure the victim into clicking on it, simply because um, uh, the URL belongs to a legitimate, honest, but vulnerable website, which is bank.com in this example. So the client side code in this particular example is sending a request to bank.com slash API slash transfer resulting in an illicit transfer of funds to the attacker's account. Therefore, the client side code allows the attacker to generate requests and control these parameters. Now, this is an example of what we call client side CSERF, but more generally client side CSERF vulnerabilities originate when the JavaScript program uses attacker controllable inputs for the generation of outgoing um, uh, asynchronous HTTP requests. So client side CSERF is, is very new with the first instance affecting Facebook in 2018 and our knowledge about this vulnerability is, is very limited. 
As such, in this work, uh, our objective is to study this new vulnerability. Specifically, one of the first questions we intended to answer was quantify the prevalence of clients at CSERF vulnerabilities in web applications. Then we were also interested to explore the different attacker models and possible types of exploitations. That is, uh, different methods an attacker can, can control a, a request. For example, by manipulating the URL, uh, document referrer, web storage, and the prevalence of uh, each of these methods. Finally, we were interested in the degree of attacker control. Um, that is, which fields of a request an attacker can manipulate in, in real web applications. For example, the endpoint of the request, including its uh, pass, um, query parameters, uh, domain um, parameters in the request body, um, and then how many parameters in each of these components the attacker can, can control, and um, basically what is the uh, level of, what is the injection point? Uh, can you append uh, to these parameters? Can you prepend or can you overwrite these parameters? Uh, and we wanted to understand the security implications of these levels of control. Now, to achieve our objective, we have to face um, several challenges that derive from the analysis of JavaScript programs. Um, because simply clients at CSERF, as opposed to the traditional CSERF, um, is a, a problem that affects the client side JavaScript programs. In particular, when we look at uh, static analysis and SAS tools, um, JavaScript is an even driven language with uh, ported type based inheritance, uh, runtime types, and coercion which means that we have no static class hierarchies and no static type uh, checking. And this level of uh, dynamicity uh, makes it difficult uh, for um, you know, uh, tools to analyze JavaScript programs. So a static analysis of JavaScript is not an easy task. For example, SAS tools need to deal with inherent dynamic language features of JavaScript, such as constructs like eval, uh, new function, set timeout, or set interval, which essentially accept a string and turn it into executable code at runtime. Now, note that these strings can be um, uh, dynamically computed, uh, obviously. Then they need to do pointer analysis for vulnerability detection, which means that, um, for example, whenever we have expressions like this.property, uh, they need to infer what heap objects uh, the construct this refers to, which is dependent on the scope and calling context. Another challenge for static analysis is essentially generating or modeling interprocedural calls. So SAS tools need to model these calls. Um, and this is not an easy task when we have a dynamically computed property read and writes in the language that are used to uh, refer to function names uh, that are invoked. And finally, we may have to handle minified or even obfuscated JavaScript code which essentially adds an, a layer of complexity to the uh, analysis the tool needs to do. And for client-side JavaScript, the problem is aggravated by the fact that modeling JavaScript code alone is not enough. The environment of the code also matters. Specifically, the client-side code runs in a rich uh, browser-based uh, execution environment, which contains the ECMAScript standard library with around 250 abstract objects, 500 properties, and 200 functions. In addition, we have different uh, you know, built-in uh, native browser APIs that the tool needs to you know, uh, model and you know, uh, incorporate the semantic of those uh, APIs into the static analysis. We have the HTML DOM tree and the interaction of the uh, JavaScript code with the DOM tree. And finally, we have the non-deterministic uh, execution of client-side events, uh, which are all an extra challenge. In addition, uh, contrary to the assumption in most static analysis approaches, um, the entire code base here is never available for analysis, um, simply because of the JavaScript streaming uh, programming model, which essentially means that the code is uh, streamed to the user's browser and at any point in time, you may have a set timeout function that loads more code. Um, so static analysis will not be sound. And last but not least, we have to handle modern client-side libraries uh, like jQuery, Angular, and so on that come with lots of overloading, uh, reflection, and callbacks. So they are sweet on the outside, but bitter on the inside for the analysis. Um, so, um, 
SAS tools need to model these libraries and uh, modeling these, you know, uh, libraries as they tend to repeat across different web, web pages, modeling these libraries again and again will lead to uh, uh, poorly scalable solutions. Okay, so I showed you some typical challenges of static analysis for client-side JavaScript, but what does they mean in the context of client-side CSERF vulnerabilities? Let me exemplify some of these uh, challenges for you. So I assume we have this function called uh, send request, which reads the URL hash fragment and uses it as an uh, endpoint of an asynchronous uh, fetch uh, request. Uh, note that we have the asynchronous fetch request that this endpoint is tainted with an attacker controllable uh, parameter. Obviously, uh, if this function is invoked at a page load, we have a client side CSERF vulnerability. So we would like to detect if this is the case, if this function send request is uh, invoked. The first challenge uh, 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 that we have, the first challenge to determine if a function send request is invoked is that uh, the invocation can happen not only via common function calls, but also via event dispatches. For instance, uh, in this particular example, we have a function invocation showing voice price, which dispatches a custom loading voice events for which we have a line of code that registers an event handler function for this event. And the event handler is the send request function. And so we have our function invoked at page load um, eventually. Another challenge is the interaction between JavaScript and DOM3. Consider, for example, um, two variables called invoice containing the same uh, DOM3 node. However, the content of one variable is fetched by a document.query selector and the other one by a document.getElementById. So essentially, we are using DOM APIs to uh, point to some elements in the DOM tree. In such a case, it is often important to determine whether the two uh, variables point to the same DOM objects that is doing points to analysis. Um, because, for instance, we would like to know uh, on which DOM element uh, an event is dispatched so as to know which event handler is, is invoked. However, it can be considerably hard to do this by just looking at the source code as DOM trees are often generated by the same program. And finally, we have to handle third-party libraries, which means that instead of having the, the fetch API to, to send the request, we may have a different function with a different signature sending the request. Uh, essentially meaning that the program delegates the task of sending asynchronous requests to libraries instead of using um, uh, built-in APIs like fetch or XML HTTP request. So it is also important to you know, model uh, uh, libraries. And in this complex landscape, we also need to factor in and possibly address general detection and operational challenges of analyzing uh, uh, CSERF vulnerabilities in general. For example, if we cannot access the code that contains the vulnerability, of course, we cannot analyze it. And this is the case when the functionality is protected by you know, access control mechanisms like uh, login. So if we want to collect the client side code, we have to log into the application and then uh, only then we can uh, see the code. Second, we would like to perform our analysis at a scale, which requires us to analyze hundreds of pages uh, of web applications. So our solution need to be performant and this is challenging because of the ever increasing uh, size and complexity of uh, client-side JavaScript programs. Then there are a few operational challenges for, for CSF vulnerabilities specifically, such as side effect retesting, meaning if you use dynamic analysis to replay or confirm CSF requests, this may change the state of the program for other tests. So there will be side effects and we don't want that. Finally, identifying um, security relevant state changes as opposed to benign uh, state changes like uh, writing to a log file uh, is another challenge. So we want only to detect security relevant changes like deleting resources, disabling two-factor authentication, or even changing passwords, but not um, um, uh, changes that are um, not security relevant, like uh, maybe writing to a log file. Okay, so to address some of these challenges in this work, we present uh, JAW, which is a scalable hybrid framework for detection and exploratory analysis of client sets of vulnerabilities, uh, leveraging property graphs and declarative traversals. So at the high level, uh, JAW is comprised of um, three components, um, data collection, model construction, and vulnerability analysis. Generally speaking, the data collection components um, 
collects the client side source code of the applications and other runtime information. The, the graph construction or model construction uh, creates an intermediate representation of the collected program. And finally, the vulnerability analysis component queries this uh, intermediate uh, representational model uh, to detect vulnerabilities. So let's have a look at the first component. At the core of this you know, data collection component is basically a Chrome-based crawler, which is automated by Selenium that uh, starting from a single seed URL of the website under tests and a set of uh, you know, state scripts that load a particular uh, you know, state into the browser before the crawling session starts, um, um, the uh, crawler will collect the, the code. So the goal of the state scripts is, for, for instance, to load a particular state like login into, into the browser. And you can also log in as different users, like login as an administrator, login as a normal user, an account with a, a premium subscription, so on and so forth. Um, then the crawler is also enhanced with a browser extension to collect various runtime uh, information, such as outgoing HTTP requests that we observed at runtime, uh, JavaScript libraries used, and so on. And the output of this step will be the JavaScript code and a set of concrete values observed during the execution of the program, which we call state values such as network messages, dynamically fired events, uh, concrete snapshots of the global window object, such as window.document, uh, web storage or window.local storage, um, snapshots of the DOM tree, and so on. And this will be essentially um, dynamic runtime information. So the data collection module will output JavaScript code and state values. Then for each web page found, the graph construction component of uh, JAW will instantiate a property graph uh, given the JavaScript code and uh, state values. To do that, JAW first creates a normalized JavaScript program by concatenating code segments uh, inside the script tags and uh, inline scripts, preserving the execution order of the program. Then um, using the data collected by the third-party library detector module of the crawler, Java will symbolically model um, uh, each library. Uh, and when a symbolic model for a given library already uh, exists, it reuses the model as a proxy for the analysis of the uh, application code. Finally, given the library symbolic model, uh, normalized JavaScript program and state values, uh, Joe creates a graph called a hybrid property graph or uh, in short HPG, which we can traverse to identify um, client-side vulnerabilities like uh, clients at CSERF. So as you can see at the core of our uh, framework jaw is the new notion of uh, hybrid property graphs. But what is a hybrid property graph? Basically, if we take three representation of the program that is abstract syntax tree or AST, control flow graph or CFG and program dependence graph or PDG, that represent the program syntax, control flow, and data flow dependencies respectively, and then combine these models at the CFG level, we, uh, we obtain a canonical model called a uh, code property graph, which was initially proposed by Yamaguchi and others for C and C++ code. Later in, um, Bakas et al. had as the interprocedural call graph to this uh, representational model and use it for vulnerability detection in server-side PHP programs. In this work, we enhance this canonical representational model with, with essentially additional models. Specifically, um, in JavaScript, the transfer of control happens uh, uh, not only by function calls, but also by events. Therefore, we add the event registration, dispatch, and dependency graph to, to model the event-driven execution paradigm of um, JavaScript programs. Also, as we will see uh, next, external libraries constitute over 60% of the total uh, JavaScript lines of code of each web page and is essentially to, to model them. For example, the detection of client-side CSERF requires to determine when the program performs HTTP requests, also by delegating it to, to library functions. Therefore, we add the semantic types and symbolic models to capture the properties of statements by labels, for example, to uh, say which instructions in the code um, send the request and label them with a, a, a tag called rec. Finally, to address the dynamic web execution environment of client-side JavaScript programs, we enrich this static representational model with dynamically collected state values, such as even traces that are traces of uh, concrete um, um, uh, HTTP requests sent and observed events, 
and uh, environment properties like the values of web storage, cookies, or snapshots of the DOM tree, and so on. Now, if we combine all these models, we obtain a graph which uh, captures both static and dynamic program behaviors, which we call hybrid property graph. Okay, so let me quickly walk you through some of these uh, new models uh, that we introduced uh, in this work. So when an event is dispatched, uh, one or more registered functions are executed, uh, which can change the state of the program, register new uh, handlers, or uh, fire new events. And to capture these interactions, we propose the, the event registration, dispatch, and dependency graph, or, or shortly ERDG. So to understand this model, uh, let us take the example of this uh, simple JavaScript program. Let's say you have a button and there is a click event handler registered on this button. So whenever a click event is dispatched, function H is executed and a new asynchronous request is sent. And somewhere in the program, the click event is uh, eventually dispatched. So having this, uh, this code, we build a graph where nodes are uh, um, non-terminal um, um, uh, uh, CFG level AC nodes involved in the event flow. And then there are three types of edges among them. The first edge models the, the dispatch of the events um, from uh, basically btn.click to btn.addEventListener. Um, the second edge models the registration of an event um, that basically we connect an edge from the add even listener function to the, to the handler uh, that is invoked. Um, and finally, the third edge uh, models the dependencies between statements and events, meaning the uh, asynchronous, uh, new asynchronous uh, request um, statement will be executed only when the, the uh, handler function H is invoked. Now, remember that this is just a model. How to automatically and accurately build this uh, model uh, without missing edges is, is another challenge. Uh, during our evaluation, we observed that external libraries account for over 60% of the total JavaScript lines of code of each web page. And this requires existing techniques to reprocess the same code when visiting a new page of the same web application, which is inefficient. So we address this uh, problem by um, extracting a symbolic model from each library and use it as a proxy for the analysis of the application code. And uh, in this work, the symbolic model is an assignment of a label to libraries functions and um, object properties, uh, which we call semantic types or semantic labels. Let me show an example. So assume that we have a, a, a library script, say uh, lib.js, which we want to model. First, we construct an HPG for the library and then we query the graph uh, for uh, uh, nodes uh, um, uh, that represent native APIs that are known for, for an uh, HTTP request, such as uh, XML HTTP requests or nodes representing APIs whose value can be uh, under the attacker control. For example, window.location. And then we assign the types uh, URL uh, or rec uh, to these nodes, uh, respectively, which will capture the semantic of these instructions. For example, rec for XML HTTP request and URL for a window the location that href. Uh, then these uh, semantic types are propagated to other nodes following the calculation of the program. That is our PDG, CFG, um, um, ERDDG graph edges, which will allow us to derive the symbolic model for the library by querying the graph for nodes with these uh, semantic types. Therefore, we will uh, realize that there is a function called, for instance, external library HTTP request uh, that, will, uh, that is used for sending an asynchronous uh, request. Similarly, libraries can be part of the data flows of a program. And to reconstruct those data flows, we define semantic types modeling um, intra-procedural input-output dependencies of library functions. For instance, we can have a label uh, like uh, or ROI uh, if the input flows to the R output or O tilde I uh, if the output of a function is conditionally dependent on its uh, input parameters. And these are only a few examples of uh, semantic types. Okay, so to show an example, once we put all these models uh, together, we will have a graph like this one, which has a static part representing the code and a dynamic part representing the runtime information. And then there are edges connecting the two models. Now, I don't want to go into the details of this graph, but just wanted to give you an idea of how it could look like. And then I can show you how we can use this for uh, detecting clients at C-Surf. 
okay, so once we have this uh, HPG, uh, this uh, hybrid property graph, um, what do we do with it? Basically, Joe imports this uh, HPG inside the graph database, in particular Neo4j, and then we can declaratively traverse this graph using the Cypher query language to explore um, uh, vulnerable program behaviors and uh, detect and study clients at CSERF. But how do we actually traverse this graph to detect clients at CSERF? Well, um, to illustrate that, let's take a step back and define what clients at CSERF is precisely. To give, to give an example, we may have this line of code that reads part of the URL hash fragment and use it verbatim as the domain of an um, asynchronous fetch operation. And in this case, our objective is to find line two, which is marked in red. Another example is the case where the developer instantiates an uh, XML HTTP request object and the URL hash fragment flows to this um, XHR. And finally, it may be that the, the developer uses a third-party library function to send a request. And also, in addition to controlling the URL, the attacker can manipulate the request body via multiple um, injection points. So looking at these examples, we can uh, define clients at CSERF as a data flow from an attacker-controlled uh, input to a parameter of a request R, meaning lines of code having both URL and REC uh, semantic types that are marked with uh, orange and uh, blue boxes uh, in the example. And then the second condition is that this request R should be reachable at page load, meaning whenever you visit the, the URL, the request is sent automatically without further uh, interaction uh, by the user. So we can model these conditions using graph covers um, uh, declaratively with the Cypher query language. For simplicity in this presentation, I exemplify the Cypher syntax with pretty good logic and set notation while retaining the declarative approach. So let me show you a simple query as an example. We can basically say that the query Q contains all nodes of an HPG for which a predicate P is two. Essentially, we have this um, 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 predicate function um, uh, saying what properties of a node, uh, uh, what properties a node should have to be included in the query result set. Note that the query is declarative in the sense that we tell the underlying query engine what we want by specifying this predicate function P um, that captures some properties that we are interested in rather than how to do it. Essentially, we delegate the task of how to do it to the Cypher query engine. And this is fantastic because we can just describe the vulnerability pattern and, and find it. Now, an example of CSERF detection query can look as follows. We are basically looking for all nodes in that are top level instructions, meaning they are declarations or statements. Um, and these node ends have two children, let's say C1 and C2. One of them has a, a rec semantic type, meaning it's a request sending instruction. And the other one has the URL semantic type, meaning it's an attacker controllable data via URL. So if a node is tainted with both of these labels, this means that we have a client side CSERF vulnerability. Finally, uh, of course, we can refine this query with uh, additional checks for uh, reachability um, that basically for every node returns in, uh, in the output of this query, we check if that node is reachable at a page load via additional Cypher queries. Now, uh, URL parameters such as the hash fragment are not the only way attackers can uh, forge asynchronous requests for uh, exploitation but actually they can do so by manipulating various JavaScript input sources, such as uh, a window name, um, post messages, and document refer. In fact, uh, web attackers can uh, forge uh, requests using these sources if they control a malicious page and abuse browser APIs to trick the vulnerable JavaScript of the target uh, page to uh, send HTTP requests. For example, we have the attacker controlled uh, page here and uh, whenever the victim visits this page, uh, a web attacker can use uh, window.open API to open the target URL uh, in a new window, send uh, post messages to this uh, open window, uh, set the, the, the name of the open window via the window name API, uh, which can be set across origins due to the same origin policy. Um, which essentially will uh, allow the attacker to, um, uh, you know, instead of sending the malicious link to to the uh, to the victim, uh, the attacker can just, you know, create this attack uh, attack page, uh, like the traditional CSERF attacks, and then we'll have the same trait model uh, as that of uh, 
uh, traditional CSAF attacks for client-side CSAF. Uh, similarly, a web attacker can also manipulate a document that refer, uh, leveraging the URL of the attacker controlled web page. Um, then a web attacker can also add ad hoc data items in um, web storage or, or DOM tree. Um, and this is the case if the web application um, offers the functionality to do so, for example, via cross-site requests, or alternatively, if the attacker has the knowledge of some um, injection vulnerability, it can basically manipulate the values uh, stored in these uh, uh, constructs. So this uh, essentially allows the attacker uh, to implant a persistent client-side CSER payload in the victim's um, uh, in the victim's browser by modifying uh, web storage, um, which can lie dormant and exploit it later on to attack a victim. Finally, a more powerful uh, net network level attacker can uh, corrupt the integrity of cookies uh, that are processed by the application to, to generate HTTP requests. So coming to the evaluation, our main questions uh, were quantifying the prevalence of clients that deserve vulnerabilities in, in web applications and identifying the degree of attacker control on, on forgeable requests and types of possible um, exploitations. As such, we evaluated our open source tool JAW with uh, 106 web applications from the Bitnomic catalog, accounting for over 228 million lines of JavaScript code. And as a result, we detected 12,701 forgeable client side requests, which affect 87 web applications. Now, these requests can be forged by manipulating various JavaScript input sources, such as URL, uh, DOM attributes, document refer, and so on and so forth, um, as I showed in the previous slides. And forging each of these input sources, of course, requires different attacker capabilities. Then we systematically look for uh, practical exploitations for um, uh, uh, 516 uh, forgeable requests, which is a random subset of uh, the, the forgeable requests we identified. And the methodology for the selection of these requests is that we first select all forgeable requests across all groups, except for uh, DOM.read category, which are requests that, uh, that can be uh, you know, tainted uh, by uh, DOM attributes. Um, considering the high number of forgeable requests of uh, uh, this category, which is 12,268 uh, requests. So for DOM.read, we uh, randomly essentially, uh, randomly selected one request per, per web application, and this resulted in uh, 516 um, requests uh, in total. Um, as a, result, as a result of our analysis, um, we created a proof of concept exploit for uh, 203 forgeable requests of, of seven web applications, such as SuitCRM, Neos, Kibana, uh, Modex, um, resulting in um, you know, different consequences, such as account takeover, deleting user assets, or execution of um, malicious queries, uh, to name only a few instances. So let me show you a real world example of clients that see serve vulnerability affecting uh, suit CRM. Uh, in this web app, the developer reads the value of a parameter named uh, AJAXCI lock uh, in the URL fragment and use it verbatim uh, as the endpoint to which an asynchronous request is sent. So looking at the code, um, there is a function called uh, first load, uh, which is invoked by events and executed at page load and a particular node is uh, ready in the DOM tree. Um, then the, the function first load um, uses the YUI library, Yahoo Util library, to read the uh, AJAX UI lock parameter from the hash fragment, which is passed to a function called uh, suit.ajaxui.go uh, as a parameter. And then the function go essentially uses its input parameter as a part of an asynchronous request. And note that this request contains a valid uh, CSAF token, which is embedded in a custom uh, HTTP header called uh, X, X signature for that request. And this allows adversaries to forge authenticated requests to any sensitive endpoint uh, of SuitCRM, corrupting the database integrity. For instance, it was possible to delete user accounts or uh, CRM models uh, uh, defined in SuitCRM like contacts, cases, or tasks um, in the web application. Another similar example is, is the vulnerability in, in Cotton T where the attacker can uh, use the URL fragment to control both the endpoint and the HTTP method uh, of the client side request. 
In particular, the, the JavaScript code first uh, passes the hash fragment to a function called um, Ajax load. This function then processes the hash fragment uh, value to determine the method and the endpoint uh, of the asynchronous request. So for example, in the hash fragment, we may have a sharp get or sharp post and then semicolon and then some key values um, uh, that are used to essentially uh, dynamically construct the endpoint to which the asynchronous request is, uh, is sent. Um, so sharp get or sharp post is specifically specify the, the request uh, 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 method. So it's a get request or it's a, a post request. And the, the key values after, uh, afterwards are essentially uh, what the attacker can use to specify the endpoint uh, um, to which the, the request is sent. So using this vulnerability, it was possible to manipulate administrative configuration of Cotton T. Uh, for example, uh, with this particular exploit, one can delete inactive user accounts older than one minute, which will probably affect most of the user accounts uh, in, in Cotton T since they were not active within the last one minute. Okay, so we know that there are forgeable requests and these requests are, are prevalent, but how bad is the problem? To determine this, we examine the degree of manipulation an attacker can have on the forgeable request because the exploitation landscape can be influenced by such level of control. As such, we characterize HTTP requests via templates where we, encode and, uh, where we encode the type and number of fields that can be manipulated, as well as the type of operation. By examining the randomly uh, chosen 516 requests, we identify 25 uh, distinct request templates. And each template reflects the level of the attacker's control on the outgoing HTTP request. Let me quickly show you three examples of templates for which we found an um, exploit. First, in 185 requests, an attacker can manipulate any part of the domain, path, and query parameters. This means that an attacker can forge requests toward other domains too. Then for 20 requests, an attacker can manipulate multiple parts of the path and a request body. And finally, for 166 requests, the attacker can only manipulate a single part of the request body, but this level of control could be enough to lead to an uh, exploitation uh, as we saw during our evaluation. Now, this was only three examples of uh, uh, request templates. Uh, please refer to our paper for more concrete cases. We also evaluated how different components of our tool contribute to the detection of client-side CSERF uh, vulnerabilities. And let me show you a few takeaways. First, when considering the, the event graph that we added, the number of event dispatch edges are around uh, 6.5 million compared to 7.1 million uh, function call edges. This means that the ERDDG representation enables the identification of 89% uh, edges transferring the program uh, control flow. Then uh, when looking at the amount of code, we observed that uh, 138 million of the total 228 million lines of code are libraries alone, while the distinct or unique library code is only 412K, uh, which is around uh, 335 times uh, smaller. Accordingly, pre-processing the library code to extract a symbolic model reduces by more than half the effort re uh, required to generate um, HPGs. Finally, to evaluate the impact of state values and dynamic uh, snapshotting, we repeated our evaluation with a variant of uh, JAW not using um, dynamic information, and we called that JAW static. First, in terms of grasp, graph construction, uh, we observed that JAW identifies uh, 10.7 million more nodes and 13.3 million more edges, meaning uh, meaning that there are some you know, nodes and edges that are missing when you only uh, consider static analysis without runtime information, which is because of dynamic insertion of uh, script tags. Then in terms of vulnerability detection, uh, JAW identifies 840 more um, forgeable requests uh, in 14 uh, web applications, which is a 7% increase in the number of forgeable requests and 19.1% increase in the number of vulnerable web applications which will be false negatives if, if we only consider you know, static analysis without runtime information. Coming to the, to the scalability and performance metrics, uh, we logged all processing times for um, throughput evaluation of our tool. 
And we observe that the analysis time is in direct correlation with the lines of code to be analyzed and their complexity. That is the number of control and data flow dependencies um, within the program. We observe that the least uh, time consuming operations are AST and intra-procedural control flow graph generation while the most time-consuming operation is a semantic type uh, propagation or simply uh, the data flow analysis for the tool. All in all, we can see that the runtime uh, could go to as high as around 400 seconds uh, per web page. So client set C serve is a critical threat to web application. And despite the severity and prevalence as shown um, uh, in this work, it can bypass state-of-the-art uh, defenses such as C serve tokens, because essentially the client side code will include those tokens uh, in the request when they generate the request. So the obvious question is, how do we defend against client side C serve attacks? To answer this question, let's take a step back and have a second look at client side C serve. So client side C serve originate when the JavaScript program uses attacker controllable inputs, say your hash fragment, to send asynchronous HTTP requests. So there is this data flow from attacker controllable data to a request sending instruction. And the problem is, is, is a trust boundary, meaning that there is a misplaced trust in unsafe input component, which is similar to other tainted style input validation vulnerabilities like client-side cross-site scripting. Therefore, the first mitigation strategy is essentially to have independent requests, that is avoiding the use of JavaScript for the generation of um, uh, outgoing HTTP requests. And instead, we can have a predefined list of safe request data, for example, request endpoints, and then have a switch parameter in the uh, input, for example, in the URL to select an option from this safe list. The second solution is uh, input sanitization, which essentially validates JavaScript input sources before using them in security sensitive HTTP requests. However, input validation is in general a challenging error prone task. So maybe a more robust solution is to have predefined you know, root structures and process URL uh, parameters with client side uh, you know, routers, such as the ones offered by modern libraries like Backbone or Angular. But again, this will work only for, you know, uh, URL. If uh, you know the attackers can change other input sources, say post messages, document refer, window name, then you know having predefined root structures by modern client side libraries will not help. And last but not least, uh, Joe can be used to detect client side CSOP vulnerabilities, as as we demonstrated in this presentation. But actually, you can use it to do more than that. In particular, uh, it is possible to define your own uh, semantic types capturing different types of uh, sources and sinks, conduct data flow propagation, and ultimately detect other tainted style vulnerability classes, such as client side XSS. So it is very easy and straightforward to extend Joe with your own semantic types. And you just need to you know, define a mapping from JavaScript language tokens to source and sync of the vulnerability you have in mind. For example, eval as a sync for uh, XSS. So summing up uh, in this talk, we first presented the, the first systematic study of clients at CSERF, which are a new breed of CSERF vulnerabilities affecting modern web applications that can bypass traditional CSERF defenses. Then to detect and study clients at CSERF, we propose JAW, which is a hybrid scalable solution that instantiates a property graph and then traverses this graph to uh, identify vulnerabilities. Then we evaluated Java with over 228 million lines of JavaScript code in 106 popular applications from the Bitnami catalog, and we were able to identify 12,701 forgeable requests affecting 87 applications, out of which we created a proof of concept exploits for 203 requests of uh, seven applications. Finally, we discussed a few mitigation techniques against clients at CSERF, such as input validation and independent requests. And with this, I would like to conclude my talk. So Java is open source and publicly accessible on GitHub. So I encourage you to have a look and play around with it. Thanks a lot for your attention. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, thank you, Suhail. Uh, for the attendees over here, please use the HUA Q&A panel to ask questions. Uh, dropping on the first question. So, it, uh, are the new countermeasures like same site cookies, like the same site cookie attribute, mitigate client side CSRF attack? That's actually a great question. So, um, by default, now we have uh, same site equal lax uh, as the default same site policy in Chromium based browsers as June. 
And um, so because of this window.open API that we have, which does not actually cover, uh, you know, these cross-site request context, attackers can still, you know, amount CSRF attacks. So um, same side is while it is effective against the traditional CSRF, it is not effective against um, client side CSRF. Even if you have same side equal as strict, um, while this feel blocked, uh, window.open, um, you know, attackers can, uh, you know, just share the links with victims. And if the victim does copy and paste the link into their browser, because it's a top level navigation, this will not be blocked by uh, same side. So yeah, the short answer is no, uh, same side cookies will not uh, essentially prevent client side CSRF attacks. Got it, thank you. Uh, and moving on to the next question, like uh, are there any specific, based on your research, are there any specific type of like web applications or JavaScript frameworks where you found that client side CSRF were more relevant on, I guess? Yeah, exactly. That's again a great question. So uh, indeed, um, um, uh, we observe that uh, client side CSRF vulnerabilities tend to happen more in single page applications, uh, okay. who you know tend to use you know uh, URL parameters like the hash fragment to you know navigate between pages or generate requests. So a significant fraction of the vulnerabilities uh, you know were noticeably uh, belong to uh, you know single page applications SPAs essentially. Uh, another question is about the jaw tool. So what's the difference between the uh, jaw tool uh, uh, other than other JavaScript analysis tool like uh, GitHub code QL queries or join? So how is it different from the tool and like what are its advantages over the other? Yeah, that's also, uh, again, a good question. So basically in, in jaw, we tend to um, model clients at JavaScript code as opposed to JavaScript in the sense of Node.js. So um, tools like, like Yarn or CodeQL, you essentially give it as an input JavaScript uh, file, uh, which is, um, you know, you have single JavaScript file um, and you don't have any DOM tree as you have like um, in, in a web page, uh, you don't have any HTML code, it's only the, the JavaScript. While in Java, we essentially uh, model the client side code and this client side code can include uh, the HTML DOM tree, uh, you know, the state values, meaning um, all the things that browser will include like cookies, local storage, et cetera, uh, and the JavaScript code, which, you know, can interact with this, uh, you know, uh, dynamic execution environment. That makes sense, yeah. Um, uh, so uh, another question is like, what do you think about like uh, identifying the vulnerabilities more likely to be on a static analysis or more on towards a dynamic analysis like a VAPT assessment? Yeah, that, that's also a great question. So I think um, static analysis could be used as an oracle to you know, uh, identify suspicious you know, cases. And then we can use dynamic analysis to, to improve the accuracy or the detection power of uh, static analysis. Somehow there are, you know, dif there are different you know, things that you can do. You can do blended analysis, which essentially means that you do a static analysis, but for a particular concrete executions of the program. So you replace you know, uh, certain you know, constructs in, in the program, like the value of closures or uh, you know, the, the state values with their concrete uh, you know, values that you see in runtime. And then you do uh, you know, static analysis for each of those executions. So this is known as blended analysis. Now, similarly, you can use you know, these state values that you see at runtime to improve the static analysis. So I would say um, the, the short answer is um, we need to use both to basically obtain the, the highest uh, precision. Perfect. Uh, that brings to the end of our question list. Uh, thank you, Suhail, for this great presentation and wonderful session. This really gave a lot of insights and knowledge on client-side CSRF. And if you have any more questions, feel free to contact him on the HUA platform. Thank you, Suhail. Thanks a lot. Yeah, have a good uh, evening, everybody. And if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thanks. <laughs>